Farming, food and fashion for a discerning world is serious business in Aotearoa, New Zealand. There are new opportunities everywhere just waiting for the open-minded. Sarah's Country shines a light on the matters that matter most. And here's your host, Sarah Perriam. Kia ora and welcome to Serious Country's Opinion Maker this week. Uh, I just wanted to throw out a number for you that's been up in the headlines recently. It's 2048. That is apparently the year that the world is going to run out of fish. Some more numbers for you. 169 is the total number of species commercially fished in New Zealand. 450,000, the total number of tonnes of seafood, not aquaculture, harvested in New Zealand waters every year. And 2 billion, the total value of our seafood exports in 2020. Uh, as we know from the well-known documentary Cowspiracy, uh, there is always more behind the numbers and the headlines, depending on who you talk to. And the sequel that's popped up uh, following the Cowspiracy on Netflix, which you were maybe might not be aware of, uh, that was based on the intensification of animal agriculture uh, and the reflection of what it has here in New Zealand to its 200 million subscribers on Netflix. Uh, the sequel... Seaspiracy. Uh, it was also the audience was myself watching uh, with a very critical eye, uh, but nonetheless described as a tabloid by scientists here in New Zealand. I was served up as possibly you were by damning evidence and dramatic footage to make a point that the industri industrial fishing is throughout the world a too often out of control and sometimes criminal enterprise that needs to be reined in and regulated. As I said, the critical thinker in me and curious journalist, uh, as well as I'd like to think educated first world citizen, knows that as there is more to the intensification of animal agriculture uh, as claimed uh, around the world, and it's not representative of New Zealand's values and management systems, I too hope that that was the case of New Zealand's seafood and aquaculture. So naturally, the first thing to do is go to the horse mouth in those parts of our sector to find out is there such a thing as sustainable fishing and how do they earn their social license as a food producer. A lot to be learnt uh, pan sector in this week's Opinion Maker. We're going to take a detailed look and fact check uh, with scrutiny at uh, this food producing industry that has come under some extreme claims. Uh, is there still work to do uh, in these sectors to make it a proud uh, sector for New Zealanders as well as a sustainable future to stay away from that first number, 2048. The world, the year the world will run out of fish. Now, later in the show, we're going to be joined by New Zealand King Salmon CEO Grant uh, Rose Warren on how sustainable fish farming is and challenges to deliver on their promises to the discerning chefs and consumers around the world. But to kick off, a woman I admire for her call a spade a spade approach to crisis communication, Seafood New Zealand's communication manager, Leslie Hamilton. Leslie, now the release of Seaspiracy, uh, I know a little bit about, about your background to the fact that this is not your first rodeo in fact-checking and navigating the storms of misinformation and how we manage our marine environment here in New Zealand. But with 96% of New Zealand's territory underwater, you do have a very big reputation to uphold on behalf of all of us. How are you coping at the moment with the attention on the sector? Oh, thanks for having me, Sarah Kiora. Um, well, you know, it's, it's pretty relentless, um, but uh, we're not alone. Primary industries um, all over the world are going through exactly the same thing. And, and what we're faced with um, is uh, basically things like subspiracy and cowspiracy, which is, it, which is less to do with fact than breathless hyperbole. I mean, in an hour and a half, there was little that was factual in it. I, I just want to preface that though with saying that um, yes, in some parts of the world there are bad practices. Yes, even in New Zealand at some point people stuff up. But on the whole and the large, um, seaspiracy, uh, you've got nothing to worry about at all. 
It probably there's so many parts I do. I'm genuinely curious about because I personally haven't been out on a commercial fishing vessel myself. I actually went into a, uh, my very first forestry operation the other day to ask questions that had been surrounding um, that how that sector works. But uh, when it comes to the fundamentals of deep sea trawling and minimising that bycatch, what does New Zealand do that is different and d- uh, from operations around the world? Well, let's um, let's address first the 2048 because you have mentioned that a couple of times. Um, the 2048 study has been discredited multiple times, including by the authors. That study came out in 2006, and um, anyone that wants scientific citations of that discreditation um, can go to the Seafood New Zealand Facebook page, um, and you will find them all there. Um, As far as sustainable fishing is concerned, in 1986, uh, we uh, introduced the quota management system, the QMS. Um, It's still held up as a paragon as far as sustainability worldwide. New Zealand is considered in one of the top five sustainable fisheries in the world. And we do that by actually counting the fish. Um, Every year, uh, MPI, uh, with the help of NIWA, go out and they do what they call a status of our fish stocks. um, And they measure the sustainability above certain levels um, of our fish stocks. And they give us a report on that every year. That report is publicly available. Uh, We're currently sitting at 91% of all fish landed in New Zealand from the stocks that are assessed as being sustainable. Uh, And with regards to the seafood harvesting, um, the precision that you put around that, what what due care is there so that the bycatch um, isn't included in that trawling out of interest? Well, there's, 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 there's a lot of new technology. Uh, we have something called AOO, AOS, um, which pretty much is a camera that goes down before the before the nets, and you can actually target the species that you want. We have a, a new technology we're very, very excited about called precision seafood harvesting, and pretty much that, that is a net where it's not towed. Well, it's towed at a very, very slow speed, so the fish are pretty much just sitting like they're in an aquarium and then they're brought up to the surface to the deck of the boat where there's another tank and they're put into water so live fish coming out of the ocean live fish going into a tank and at that point you can take live fish that you don't want and put them back in the ocean what about with regards to long line fishing and protecting the likes of seabirds Uh, There are so many uh, things that we are doing as far as seabird mitigation is concerned. It's mandatory on all of New Zealand's fishing vessels um, to have mitigation methods uh, for seabirds. Um, We use um, a whole number of them, Uh, the most simple of which and one of the most effective are called Tory lines, which are basically streamers that go out the back of the boat and they distract the birds from the nets um, or from the lines. Uh, We use weighted hooks. Um, and and weights so that the lines sink faster underwater than the birds can dive for them. We use coloured dyes on our baits, which the birds find repugnant. Um, so there are all sorts of measures that we do. We also um, put all of our fishermen through seabird safe uh, workshops. Um, they help scientists. They look after the black petrel uh, population. Uh, so there's an awful lot of work going on there. And, you know, our guys, and I've seen guys um, that have caught birds, particularly, you know, some of our endangered species, albatrosses and petrels, and they're absolutely gutted. You know, no one wants to catch a bird, so they do all they can not to. Mm. When it comes to with the cameras on boats, I understand um, that's been a huge move forward for the industry to showcase transparency 24-7. What's it been like for the crews on board to sort of operate with Big Brother over their shoulder all the time? Have they embraced that? Embrace would probably be a step too far. Um, it is intrusive, um, but much of the fleet does already have cameras on. Some of them, a lot of them, voluntarily, um, and the entire fleet will be fitted with um, with cameras you know, in the near future. Um, There are a number of problems we had. We are not anti-transparency. There are a number of problems we had with with cameras, one of which you you, uh, noted, which was the privacy issues. It depends where the cameras are sighted on the vessel because these are these guys' homes. They're on them 24-7. And, you know, you don't want to 
camera watching you eat or sleep or or whatever. There was also the expense of them because pretty much they are a compliance tool um, for the Ministry for Primary Industry. So who was going to pay for him? That that's uh, that was another issue we had. And another issue we had was data. What happens to the data? So. If the reason that these cameras are going on vessels is for compliance, then our argument was that only MPI should see that data um, and that it should not be readily available available publicly because there are people out there, like our seaspiracy and cowspiracy friends, um, that really just want to put together horror reels of things that are happening that, you know, um, may happen years and years apart or may have happened a decade ago. Um, And so those are some of the concerns we have with cameras. But overall, we are all for transparency. Just one more thing on transparency. Um, MPI out at Petone has uh, its compliance um, office. And out there, and any journalist can ask to go and have a look, um, there's two huge wall-sized screens, and you can see every single fish fishing vessel in this country where it is. You can see whether it's moving or whether it's stationary. You can see what it's catching. Um, and um, that all reports in real time into MPI. You can see if it strays into somewhere it's not supposed to be, like a marine protected area, in which case an alarm goes off and MPI can monitor that. So there is transparency out there um, already, and it's getting more transparent. Now, as I said in the introduction about admiring your work, Leslie, that's um, absolutely genuine. I remember a presentation, I think, was to the Red Meat Sector Conference, am I correct? On a panel around... You've done a couple of those. <laughs> yeah, the work that you've done and going and like you've just explained, that that huge big TV screen in Petone. Um, and it's, it's an ongoing uh, issue whereby consumers are hungry genuine to be more connected to the food that they have not grown and harvested themselves which is understandable in all of your years of communication what has been those things that have resonated enough to to build genuine trust and confidence I don't think we're anywhere near that I don't think we're anywhere near. I've, I like to tell the story about Marks and Spencer, which is a department store in the United Kingdom. Um, and they started a trust and reputation campaign in the 70s. Um, they still haven't got there. They were trying to change their brand from a somewhat cheap brand to you know, a more quality brand. They still haven't got there. Trust and reputation um, campaigns take decades and decades to move. And the problem that we're facing with public perception at the moment is that people don't know who to believe. Their trust in mainstream media has dropped, their trust in journalists has has dropped, their trust in spokespeople has dropped. Um, Even Even remarkably, their, (laughs) their their trust in social media has dropped as well. So pretty much what you're faced with now, um, which I I told a conference in Queenstown a couple of weeks ago, um, is they trust uh, their feelings. That's that's what they trust. So you've got to appeal to their hearts um, and be as transparent as you can and continue to improve all your practices, which we are doing. But it is very frustrating, not just for our sector, but for all of the primary industry, when you are faced with fiction overriding fact. And it is always much harder to correct um, a fiction than it is for people to believe fact in the first place. So it's a difficult job. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And um, I'm, uh, I don't know if I'm saddened to hear that there's still so much more work to do uh, when, you know, I admire the work that, uh, you know, Seafood New Zealand have done and multi-million dollar TV campaigns, commercials, transparency, far beyond what the work of pastoral agriculture has done in New Zealand from a um, consumer connection perspective uh, w- wider. So so therefore ongoing, uh, what is the continual strategy for the seafood industry to further educate around how New Zealand's practices aren't being done globally is there a way for us to lead from the front to say to the world globally that this is not okay some of these practices there is um i like to say you know it's it's that old adage how do you eat an elephant you eat it one bite at a time um you've just got to keep chipping away but the seafood industry like 
um, other primary industries. Um, is very fond also of another saying, the Kumaro does not speak of its own sweetness. We have not told our stories for years, for decades. You know, um, back in the 50s, we were the poster child. We were the backbone of the New Zealand economy. Um, so we haven't been proactive in telling the very, very, very good stories of our practices for decades and decades. We're not going to turn that around quickly, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be trying. Mm. Yes, no, 100% agree with you. I heard actually someone the other day say we are not the backbone of the economy. We are the uh, benefactors of the backbone of the economy, which is the environment. And I thought that was a beautiful way uh, to sum it up and rephrase our own ego and attitude towards um, this before we begin to tell our own story to ourselves as well. So uh, it's an interesting one. Um so where to in the next 12 months to 24 months uh, ahead for Seafood New Zealand's um, technology advancements and scientific advancements to continue to build on the work that has been done for decades? Well, we put, um, we put millions of dollars into innovation every year, and we will continue to do that. We've done, we've done this for, for a very long time. Um, our immediate focus, um, which will be... Um, your sectors as well is on jobs and putting Kiwis into jobs. You know, some of us um, have relied on foreign labour, the seafood sector, not to a great extent apart from in very, very large vessels. Um, but the government has been uh, very quick to signal and very clear um, that they want more Kiwis into that job. We know, I know, you know, it's not as easy as that. Um, but our focus will be on um, re-educating uh, workforce. We're doing a lot of work um, with schools, a lot of work with academies, a lot of work with training institutions um, to give people a better idea about what a career in the primary industries and a career, uh, particularly in seafood, is about. Um, but that's not going to be a quick fix as well. But that, that's our immediate focus. Mm. Leslie, thank you so much for your time. Leslie Hamilton, the Communications Manager for Seafood, Seafood New Zealand, uh, speaking to us there post Seaspiracy and leading us on through our opinion maker. We were going to continue to look now to the aquaculture or fish farming uh, side of the business with Grant Rosewarn, the CEO of New Zealand King Salmon, up next here on Serious Country. Well, continuing to unpack this conscientious documentary uh, by streaming giant Netflix, Seaspiracy, towards the end they turn to fish farming or aquaculture, which makes up 50% of the fish consumed globally. And they showed footages of piles of dead fish and sea lice infected live salmon in Scotland. Well, I did a bit of a Google and the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation has refuted the allegations that the industry is guilty of animal welfare abuses uh, leads to loss of wild fish stocks and polluting the surrounding seas. So I, of course, wanted to continue to find out more around what we do here at home. And New Zealand King Salmon has 30 years in farming, processing and branding and is the largest producer of this unique breed in the world. They're the only salmon species that are farmed, whilst the rest of uh, salmon in the Atlantic is in the world's oceans. King Salmon is considered to be uh, of discerning choice from chefs from Sydney, Tokyo and the US as the best tasting salmon. Uh, but has the tide turned on the industry with this bright spotlight on the environmental responsibility and animal welfare expectations of fish farming? Well, ahead of their own documentary, Aura King Salmon uh, has claimed that sustainable husbandry practices are well in tune with nature. And New Zealand King Salmon CEO Grant Rosewarn uh, joins us now. Grant, how's the salmon industry feeling globally and here at home after this world? worldwide attention this documentary has given it. Uh, hi, Sarah. Well, it's fair to say, you know, we're always up for transparency and engagement. And overall, we've got a great story to tell. So as long as things stay science and fact-based, we're positive about that. We think there is a huge amount of misinformation out there, uh, including, I just need to correct one thing that you said there. So most Atlantic salmon is farmed. Uh, and in fact, now most king salmon is also farmed. So, but Atlantic salmon is produced to the tune of 
2.4 million tonnes and king salmon 15,000 tonnes, so a tiny mm -hmm. fraction. So we're, we're, we're about 1% of the total world supply of salmon. There are still some wild species that are caught, like sockeye, a little bit of coho or, or silver salmon, um, some pink and some chum, but the vast majority of salmon is now farmed and uh, most of that, you know, I'd say virtually all of it very sustainably actually, including the Scottish industry, which I very much respect. Um, we have some natural advantages here. One that you mentioned is that we farm the pinnacle of the species, the king salmon. It is the hardest to farm. There's only five producers in the world, so four in New Zealand and one in Canada. Um, and you can, we get a premium price for it. But in, in terms of sea lice, which is the equivalent of a flea or a tick sort of in the ocean, our species doesn't get sea lice. So we don't have any of the issues associated with, you know, treating that or problems around that. And there are some great practices for dealing with sea lice in the sea, including some just use uh, fresh water uh, to deal with that. So they put the fish through a fresh water bath and, and others use, uh, you know, some other treatments and things. But it's not something that we have to worry about in New Zealand and also in Australia, it's not a, it's not a known practice to have to deal with sea lice either. So Australasia uh, just doesn't, is not confronted with this issue. Okay, and if I just work through some questions for you, Grant, which are obviously similar across um, all parts of food production, particularly when it involves livestock, um, what about the feed that you feed the salmon? Uh, I understand in parts of the world there is wild fish fed to the salmon or soy products fed to the salmon. What do we feed our New Zealand king salmon? So, So in terms of the makeup of the feed when you go back to you know a basic level we're trying to replicate as closely as possible what the fish have in the wild but that means in terms of the amino acid profile the fatty acids that are present the vitamins and the minerals and all those things but it doesn't have to come from marine sources so some of it does but uh, these days the minority comes from marine sources we believe that assists in our sustainability so you mentioned that half the world's seafood comes from aquaculture so even if you had uh, a fantastic feed conversion ratio which can be achieved with salmon of a one-to-one -one feed conversion ratio so a five kilo fish is only eaten five kilos of feed in its life if it was eating wild fish to get there well that would mean the 50% that are aquaculture eating the 50% from the wild, which obviously isn't going to work out too well for anybody. So what we've uh, learned to do over time is to use a vegetable protein as a substitute, but also we can use the trimmings and offcuts from the, the, the beef industry, the sheep industry. And so we can take those trimmings and offcuts, turn them into a meal, uh, make sure it's got the, the right um, protein profile, the right fatty acid profile. We still put a bit of fish oil in there because that's important to the diet, but even that is, is being replaced by algal oils now. So they're ultimately fed a pellet that, that has the same makeup as, the, as, as close as possible to the wild situation, but the origins of that, in our view, are very much more sustainable than feeding uh, lots of fish to salmon and not, not being any further ahead in terms of the output of seafood. What about fish pen waste? On a little bit of a Google, I understand that there was some trouble in the Marlborough Sounds uh, with the excessive level of uh, fish pen waste hurting seabed life and starving it of oxygen. Uh, but you were quoted saying that some of the regulations potentially are outdated and not in tune with the practices. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So most of our farms are situated over mud flats. So certainly of all of our low flow farms, we're not talking about the Great Barrier Reef here. So we're talking about mud flats, um, and the 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 effect of a salmon farm is you do have more nutrients in the water. That actually generally leads to an increase in biodiversity and abundance of native species around the farm so so lots of lots of these species will move in whether it be you know sea slugs or power or other fish or whatnot so the the 
the C is incredibly well adapted to handling handling the organic manic that comes from fish. Fish are, you know, school, they go around in huge numbers. Yes, they there's the organic matter that comes from the fish, the, the feces from the fish. But, you know, this has been going on in the sea for millions of years. And there's a whole community that, that processes that and turns it into the food for the next animal in the food chain. And that's exactly what happens uh, under and around a salmon farm. You have a, a better outcome if you're in a high flow, high oxygen situation. And we seek to, that's ideally where we'd like to put our farms. And there you truly do get an amazing outcome. But if I just, just explain, you know, sometimes these regulations are way out of date. We, we actually got a fine on one occasion for having too many native species in too greater abundance at one of our, our far field sites, which we go, well, if this was a dairy farm hmm. and, you know, a, a, there were too many kiwi birds on there, uh, you know, uh, and would a, would a dairy farmer get a fine for that? Well, no, no, they wouldn't. Uh, but the reality is any difference, even if it's a positive one, is, is sometimes frowned upon. And, and we, we just don't think that's, that's appropriate. We, we, we fully believe that, that aquaculture is one of the most sustainable ways of producing animal protein on the planet because, first of all, we have an amazing feed conversion ratio. We can use the, the outputs of other uh, animal production industries. We produce a really healthy product and we can have a net positive increase in the, in the abundance and the biodiversity of native species around the farm. And you just there's no other industry that can really do that. Mm. What about with regards to um, production yields and chasing genetics for 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 weight uh, into some of these markets? Is there anything there that needs to be of concern about, or are, is, are the salmon being fished in a way that would have been quite uh, close to nature? So we we have a classical breeding program. So we cross the best males with the best females. So we have about 150 different families of salmon. They all have their different traits and characteristics. And we, we cross them to achieve the ideal outcome that a chef or a restaurateur wants. So, you know, that, that goes to the size of the fish. It goes to the, the color of the fish, the body condition of the fish, the fat content, um, the, 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 the firmness of the flesh, all those things are selected for in a classical breeding program in the same way that, that farmers on the land have bred Wagyu beef to be what it is. We've done the same thing for our king salmon. It's, it's probably true to say we're probably decades behind. You know, we're not as well uh, down the track because we just haven't had as many crosses uh, to get there. But j we are always improving our livestock to be exactly what chefs and restaurateurs want. And we just do use the classical methods to achieve that. And when you said that the percentage that New Zealand king salmon make up of salmon worldwide, it's so, so small, yet um, in similarity to the the, you know, brush that tarnishes pastoral agriculture from some of these detrimental documentaries from US practices on New Zealand. Um, do, do you worry that the world is moving fast enough of its sustainable aquaculture movements globally um, that it won't have detrimental effect on New Zealand? Um, well, I'm what I'm worried about is misinformation out mm. there. So if you look at the United Nations, the Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, if you even look at WWF or the Nature Conservancy, they've all recognized that aquaculture is stunningly efficient. It has a, a light impact on the environment for, for the output and the quality of the output and the abundance of the output. And as I mentioned, if, you, if we are sited in the best places, we can even get a net environmental gain. So that's being recognized by governments in the United Nations, uh, ENGOs, but there's always a, a, a rabble who, 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 that's probably a little unkind, there's always, a, you know, groups that are 
anti anything that's not, you know, a a a hobby farm situation. Um, and that's what some people want. They want well, they they want food produced in a hobby farm situation that probably would lead to mass starvation around the world if it, if it actually was brought in. Um, and and don't recognise the great practices that we've got. So the fact that we would get criticism about sea lice, which is not even a problem that we have, and sometimes we get criticism about antibiotics and nobody in New Zealand has ever used antibiotics in aquaculture. So we get tarred with all these things which are just not true. And it's incredibly frustrating uh, that the that both it's easy to to cast dispersions and throw mud, but it, it, it can be hard to correct that. And even though we enjoy a lot of support from say WWF or the Nature Conservancy or the UN are they there actually standing with a flag um, uh, explaining the positive benefits? Well, if you read their reports, yes, but do they do they respond to something like sea spiracy or something like that? Well, not in any way that is a counterbalance to a Netflix series. So there just seems to be an inequity out there in terms of misinformation versus facts. And yeah, that increasingly concerns me. But you see it right across society. It's not just agriculture or aquaculture, it, it applies to politics, it pretty much applies to everything. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, Seaspiracy is just um, targeting this particular industry right now, um, yet everything's under fire uh, if you look hard enough um, at it and you know yeah so I really genuinely appreciate you taking the time to come on I know that the serious country audience are critical thinkers and uh, and, and will take the information that we've just heard there from Leslie and Grant forward uh, with you know a, a lot more confidence that we can be proud of a sector that we may not know a lot about when we're working in another part of the primary industries appreciate your time Grant thank you very much Thank you, Sarah. And just a point on Seaspiracy. It was originally a documentary, like a facts-based documentary, but it's been reclassified as a movie because it's it's you know movies can be based on fiction. So it's been reclassified into a movie category rather than a documentary uh, because of the, the the gaps in its its uh, integrity there. Valid, valid point there from Grant. Um, good to see Netflix is taking responsibility for acknowledging what it is actually uh, distributing. So, But it just shows you this is the world that we do have to accept that we live in now, a world of misinformation. And good on you for tuning into this particular program where I do my absolute best to at least bring a variety of diversity of voices around some of these issues and challenges uh, so that you with an open mind uh, can go forth with critical thought on those issues and challenges. And I really genuinely appreciate you for tuning in uh, to our live stream, which happens on YouTube and Facebook, seven o'clock on Tuesday nights. You can tune in to our Opinion Maker. All the details are on seriouscountry.com. If you're listening to this on podcast and you're a regular podcast listener, you know the drill. We're back tomorrow with our Change Maker series. We have uh, Bridget Hawkins, formerly of Regen, uh, an agricultural technology that is helps uh, irrigation and effluent management. And that has been acquired by a large organisation called CropEx. So I have some great chats to her about a New Zealand's ag tech scene on our change maker and then uh, our next week on our opinion maker we're going to delve into the world of farm succession planning something that seems to be a bit of an elephant in the room uh, at time to time yet we're going to have a head-on discussion with three different angles at it uh, a family succession coach who has been in the business for some time sharing his advice Philip Pryor uh, Phoebe Davies from Wynn Williams will bring you up to speed on everything trust law and things you may need to consider when it is about that almighty succession planning from a legal perspective. And Tom Lamming has his own personal uh, journey with farm succession with growing up on a Waimati sheep and beef property, now working for NZAB in Timaru, uh, helping support family farms navigate the, their financial security with the banks. All three of them on together as we unpack and provide you with the advice and tips around what can be a very challenging discussion. 
all that on Sarah's Country. Make sure you subscribe to Sarah's Country Club, an email newsletter that comes out on a Sunday evening, letting you know about the details on the show coming up this week and what you may have missed, making it easy for you right there in your inbox. You can subscribe at sarahscountry.com. I really appreciate you tuning in. Send me an email, sarah at sarahscountry.com. And uh, we'll be back again next week. Hare ra. Hare ra.